Hello, and welcome to the first of a new series of Norsar videos. This particular video is aimed as an introduction or perhaps a quick refresher to some of the basic operations within the software suite. We'll continue this series with shorter, more specific videos going forward. If there are any particular topics you would like to see, please let us know in the comments or shoot us an email at sales at norsar.com. Just briefly about Norsar Innovation. We are a wholly owned subsidiary of the research foundation, NORSAR, specializing in seismic modeling software and services for the EMP industry. We offer a unique ray tracing solution that has been used by leading EMP companies worldwide for more than 20 years. The core applications of the NORSAR software suite include illumination analysis, survey planning, Kirchhoff modeling, 4D time-lapse studies, and reservoir analysis. In addition to developing, commercializing, and providing worldwide support for Norsar's cutting-edge software solutions, Norsar Innovation also offers expert consulting and training services within our field, providing objective recommendations based on our unbiased, state-of-the-art technologies. If you want to learn more about Norsar Innovation, I've added some useful links below in the comments. So with all that said, we'll have a quick look at the modules we have on offer, and then get into the software itself. This is our software portfolio, including the ray tracing packages NORSA 2D and NORSA 3D, a patented fast track PSDM simulation and rock physics tool called ZeissRox, and MDesign for optimizing micro seismic sensor networks. All of these packages are fully integrated on a common platform called NORSA Software Suite. The suite is complemented by two PET12 plugins that are mainly beneficial for ZeissRox, and the MESA connector that is mainly beneficial for NORSA 3D. This video is focusing on getting started with NOSA 3D, so please refer to other videos and material if looking for more advanced information. When you start the software, you are first prompted to give the type of license you are running. The license is controlling which elements of the software are active. Obviously, you can run several packages in parallel as they are using the same project environment and can share all kinds of data. When the software comes up, it automatically opens the last project you were working in and indicates the path in the information line. You also see a time domain viewer, a depth domain viewer, an object list, and a workflow tab. The object list provides access to all the data that are loaded to the project or generated inside the project, which also means that if you later use workflows to generate modeling results, these modeling results will also be available from the object list. However, if you want to start from scratch, the first thing you need to do is to generate a new project environment, which can be done from this button upper left. There are different options. The custom option would allow for manually defining all project parameters as you need them. The project template allows you for adopting parameters from an existing project. That means you can generate an empty project, but using the parameters of an existing project. Now if you press OK, you first select the project you want to adopt the parameters from, press select, and then you give the path and the name of the new project you are generating. That brings you straight into the project definition panel, which by the way is the same panel you would have reached using the custom option for the project definition, with the difference that in this case some of the fields are already pre-filled according to the parameters of the project we are using as a template. As you can see, we are carrying along three different types of coordinate systems. The main coordinate system of, is, of course, the global UTM coordinate system. But we can also define inline crossline numbers, and the inline crossline system can have a rotation with regard to UTM. And we generate a local coordinate system, which always is parallel to inline and crossline. In order to establish a relationship between these coordinate systems, we give the coordinates for a single reference point and we give these coordinates in UTM numbers, in inline crossline numbers and in local numbers. And once we have done this, all we need to do is to add the rotation to our project and define the size of the area, which can be given in inline crossline numbers or in local coordinates. Note that down here there is a coordinate transform calculator. If you type in parameters for any of these coordinate systems, you get the corresponding values for the other two coordinate systems. So this panel down here is not used for defining a project, it is used for QCing a project. 
Note also that the rotation of a project and the inline crossline numbers are mainly used for comparing modeling data with field data. If you do not yet have any inline crossline numbers available, you just give some reasonable numbers. And also the rotation that, that is defined does not predefine any modeling direction you use in your project. You still have the full flexibility and freedom to do whatever you like in the project independently of the rotation. So once your project parameters are fine, you just press OK and confirm the setup and then you are opening the new project which is indicated in the information line. As in this demonstration, we will only work in the depth domain. I close the time domain window for the time being. So now I have an empty project and in order to do some ray tracing, I need to import some data or to generate some data. So the first thing I need to do or I want to do is to import a target interface which I have stored on my hard disk. So in the object list, I have different directories and one of them is called surfaces. And if I do a right click on there, I can get to an import wizard for simple XYZ three point data. So this is data on my hard disk. There is a file that is called target. I can do a right click on this and select browse and I can see the contents of the file. I can see that it's obviously written in local coordinates and the unit obviously is meters. So this helps me setting up the import wizard. So I give the local coordinate system and I make sure that the units for the import are meters. I can also skip over some header lines if there are some in. I can press next. I can select the columns in the file which I want to read. In this case, I use the default because it's a simple XYZ. I press next. I can analyze the file which is recommended. And if I click finished, then the file is imported. And then I have access from the object list to the file and I can check the display box in order to look at this file. So I can use the left mouse button and keep it pressed and do some rotation. I can use the wheel of the mouse for zooming in and out and I keep the wheel of the mouse pressed for translating the display. So I can inspect my imported data from all kinds of perspectives. The next thing I want to do is to generate a C surface interface. Again, I can import this from external data, but I can also do this directly inside the software by generating a new analytic plane grid. So I can give the name, which is surface. I leave this number zero because I want to have a surface at zero depth. And I can define the size of the interface to be generated. And I select it in this case, according to the size of my target interface, which I happen to know. And then I press OK and I have a second surface imported. The next thing I need is properties. And again, I can generate properties inside like constant properties or gradients, but I can also import a ZY cube. I can go to the properties directory, do a right click and then get the import function for a ZY property cube. Obviously I have to browse to the location where my external data are located. And I find my ZY cube and I press open and I get into the import wizard. Again, I have to give the coordinate system and the units. And if I'm not sure about them, I can always open um, and check the trace headers and get the information from there. So in this case, the coordinates are fine and also the units are fine. Now I can click next. I can see which part of my project area is covered by the imported cube which also is fine. If I need, I can downsize or downsample the velocity cube during the import already, which is not required in my case. I click next, then I can give the units and the type of property, which also is fine. And I click next and okay and finish. And I have my velocity cube imported and can display it in the very same way as I display the interfaces. If I do a right click on the slices, I get control on the slices and can just move them around and I inspect my property cube slice by slice as I need them for QC. So this already looks like a model I can use for ray tracing, but actually it's not. It's just some data elements which, was, which were selected for display. 
So now the next thing I need to do is to put together these data elements into a model. And for this, I can go to the model directory and I see different options here. For example, I could generate a 1D model from a, a well lock and then expand it into three dimensions. Or I could draw a 2D model by mouse and expand this into 2.5D. But what I want to do now is to generate directly a 3D model. So I can do a right click and I get different model building options down here. There's a general model builder that allows to build any kind of model, which can be very complex. But there are other model building options for simple cases. When I only have simple input data, then I have a semi-automatic function that facilitates the model building process a lot. In this case, I only have two interfaces and the property cube, which I want to put together. So this is sufficient to use a la grid layer cake model builder. So in there, all I need to do is to give a name for my new model. I can define the size, the area that is covered by my model. And I just, again, give the size of the interfaces I know of. And I have to indicate how many grids I want to use. I only have two grids in my project. It's the surface grid and it's the target grid. And then I can define the properties underneath these grids. So for the main part of my model, I want to use the, Z the um, velocity cube, which I imported. And below the target, I just use a constant velocity. And I also define a small density contrast. And that's actually all I need to do. If I click OK, then automatically a ray tracing model is generated. So I switch off the display of my data elements and just look at the display of my model, which is generated and ready for ray tracing. So the next thing I need is a survey. I can load the survey from SPS or P190 or ASCII files from external data, or I can just generate a nominal survey inside the software. For that, I just use this new function. I give a name of my new survey and get into the survey definition panel. I have different options here. If I use the fixed option, I can use fixed shot and receiver grids. Instead, I can use coil surveys. I can generate different types of VSP surveys, or I can generate a marine survey, which uses a shot-centered coordinate system for the receivers, meaning that the receivers are following the shots as they would do for a toad streamer survey. And this is exactly what we generate now. We have a receiver and a shot part. Um, for the uh, shot side, I just define the coordinate system. So sometimes it's easier to do this in local coordinates. And I give the center of the shot grid. I give the depth of the shots, which I just defined to be at five meter depth. I don't want to have any rotation, so I set this to zero. Then I give the number of shot lines, just say 10, six kilometer shot line length. Uh, shot line spacing of 400 meters, um, a shot spacing of 50 meters probably. And I give a flip-flop to shot to say line distance of 25 meters because later on I will use a streamer spacing of 100 meters. I can also use a triple source option, but I'm fine with the flip-flop setup in this case. So I have defined the shot grid, then I add the receivers. Again, I give the depth of the receivers, I just leave them as well at five meters. Minimum offset of 100 meters is fine. I want to have eight cables to be towed uh, with six kilometers length and the streamer spacing of 100 meters and the 25 meter receiver spacing is fine in my case. Then I get indication of how many shots and receivers I have generated. And if this is fine, I can press OK and my survey is generated here. So I switch off the model display for a moment and I get a display of my survey. I see the flip-flop nature of the shots and the receivers for the first shot. I now have all I need for first ray tracing test. So what I do, I go to the workflow tab and I select the software I'm using. So obviously my license allows for running both size rocks and Nosa 3D. I want to use Nosa 3D, which is already selected and I select the interactive wavefront tracer. 
In order to generate a new workflow, I press the upper left button and I give a name, which I call test, and I get a predefined workflow structure. And all I need to do is to double click on each workflow element in order to fill in some input data, which is already stored in the object list. So if I do a double click on the model, I can just select the model which we have generated. I double click on the survey, and I select the only survey which we have in our project, and I have to define a ray code. A ray code defines the part of the ray field which is modeled. As you know, ray tracing will only compute selected parts of the ray field. There can be many parts combined, but you would never do the full ray field for ray-based modeling. In this case, I want to do a PP reflection for my target, and for a simple ray code like that, I only need to check this definition box. If I want to have more complex ray codes like uh, mode conversions or multiples, I have a general ray code generator down here. But in this case, PP is fine, and I just confirm by OK. And I can also define some ray tracing parameters. Most of them are used to accelerate the process for the ray tracing, to make it more efficient. The exact meaning of all these parameters will be explained in a different video. In this case, I just relax the wavefront parameters a little bit in order to make the run a bit quicker. And I also make sure that this box is checked to store the wavefront data, the reason you will see in a second. So I press OK, and then my workflow is fully defined, as you can see from the green markings on the workflow elements. Before I run the workflow, I would like to indicate that this is an interactive wavefront tracer, and it's meant to run single shots in order to optimize the uh, wavefront tracing parameters. So we select some shots which are representative, so in this case, I use one which is somewhere at the center of my, of my project grid. And I also add the display of my target interface, so we can better see what will happen. So here's my target interface. And this is the single shot I am modeling now. And in order to run the workflow, I just press this button up here. So what happens is that I see the workflow running and because this went quick, I can press this checkbox here and then I can replay the, work, the wavefront. So I can see how it is starting from the shot location. I can go back and forth and see how it is moving in the model. Then I can see how it is reflected at the target and then it goes up to the receiver and the information is stored. I click this checkbox, then I get a spikogram, and by mouse I can select the part of the spikes for a single cable, which I want to see the rays for. So I get information about the ray path, I get information about the reflection points, I get information about travel time from this tool. So I could now do the same exercise for several representative shots in my survey until I know that my ray tracing parameters are fine, and then using the very same ray tracing parameters for any other workflow I have available. For example, for generating illumination maps or for generating synthetics. That's it for now, and thank you for following this introduction. If you have questions or are interested in an evaluation license, please contact us at sales at See you soon on this channel.